Welcome to the Cartoonist Kayfabe Courtroom. My name is Ed Piscor. I'm the Honorable Jim Rugg. Going to be continuing and possibly finishing the Todd McFarlane uh, deposition testimony here today on uh, this week's episode. Uh, before we do that, I want to thank everybody who has liked and subscribed to these videos, the people who have hit the bell icon whenever we... Um, uh, put a new video out. Uh, the cool thing is, if you do that, you you get first dibs on the comics that we talk about on Amazon and eBay because uh, the kayfabe effect is real. And when we talk about some comics, they disappear off of those kind of third-party uh, s- sellers. So uh, that, that helps uh, you out. And the thing that helps us out is uh, when these videos get watched to the end, uh, it pushes the YouTube algorithm out to the uh, the wider comic book viewership world that might not know about cartoonist kayfabe and uh just increases the numbers of subscribers which we have seen probably on the strength of some of these deposition videos because they are rapidly becoming the favorite of uh, a a nice subsection of the kayfabe audience jimmy and i like the idea that we have like sub genres of cartoonist kayfabe videos now (laughs) it's it's like our own bibliographies i remember uh dan klaus saying this and i I was always curious about it because i'm a dan klaus fan and i'll read whatever he makes but he would say um there are very few people small percentage of people are fans of my work there are ghost world fans there are dan pussy fans but there are very few it's a small subsection of people who are fans of the bibliography and then doing you know WYSIWYG and x-men grand design and hip-hop family tree and red room same deal right like there's a very small amount of people who are like ed i'll just buy whatever um the hip-hop people are the hip-hop people and so on and so forth so that's a thing and i make sense that our videos would be that way but where we left off last week man uh lots of stuff uh, we've gotten to minutia about the dc contract and i do think that Todd McFarlane was potentially not under the uh, was poten- he was potentially under the assumption that the Neil Gaiman DC contract is the Todd McFarlane DC contract from Infinity Incorporated. <laughs> and uh, that's a good way to phrase that. I, I think I think Uncle Neil uh, contributed a little bit more to the culture over there at DC that made him have some more uh, negotiative uh, wiggle room. I wonder about the contract minutia. On all this stuff. Because I think about like, you know, we follow Rob Liefeld talking about Deadpool. And I feel like around the time of Deadpool and Cable may have been the most favorable contract for if you're going to get some uh, character create, you know, create a character at Marvel. Uh, around that time's a good time. And it makes me wonder like, what's McFarlane's Venom contract? You know, because I, I don't know if he has any piece of Venom or if, you know, contracts were different. Um Interesting that there are these variety of contracts and under different regimes and different timetables and maybe different what your lawyer brings to it. Yeah. Um, you know, that, that, that it isn't one contract fits all is my impression. And, um, yeah, it makes me wonder, like, uh, what some of Todd's contracts were. And it seems adverse to using lawyers. So yeah. I would guess that his contracts weren't the most adva- advantageous you could get if you were really trying to. And... Uh, you know, mysteries, probably things I'll never know, but it's interesting to me just thinking like it does feel like there are different contracts with different creators out there. So ask for everything, you know, before you sign that contract. Um, do get a lawyer involved would be some of my takeaways from these things. Yeah, yeah. Uh, in the earliest parts of the deposition, of which there are links in the description directly below this video, uh, it was quite clear that McFarlane did not have contracts for a lot of stuff. You know, a lot of homeboy level shit, man. Like, oh, you get this page rate. That's what you get. Probably when uh, royalties start to become a bigger player in that Spider-Man era, you need need to at least know what that stuff is. Um, Signing up with Marvel myself. uh, Like, I got a bump. And it was a good faith bump. Like, they didn't... They actually did generate a fresh contract. But they said, we don't do this. We don't usually do this. Like, but I wanted it. Like, I'm like, I will prove it. Like, I want to see it on paper. And they did it, like, sort of because I was being naggy to them. But they let me know, you know, we don't usually do this. Uh, I think a lot of people, they they just don't get the stuff in writing, man. They're they're very excited to get to draw Spider-Man. Too excited, perhaps. So, uh, I think we 
finished one round of questioning and we pick up with some new level of disagreement, potentially Miracle Man era stuff. Who knows? Yep. Are you uh, are you ready to resume? Yes. The way it works uh, is Jimmy plays the voice of everybody who is not Todd McFarlane. This is defense lawyers. This is uh, lawyers for the plaintiff. And uh, every now and then the judge and or stenographer shows up. Jimmy puts on many hats. That's true. That's just like true. Mc, just like McFarlane <laughs> puts on many hats, depending on his answers. I'm the answers of uh, Todd McFarlane. The stuff that I read is verbatim to what Todd McFarlane has written and uh, what is on the record. So uh, take that for what you will. And if you're ready to go, I'm ready to go, Jimmy. All right. Have we covered the disputes that arose between you and Neil other than the disputes that relate to royalties? And what I mean by that, we have discussed disputes that have related to royalties, but I just want to make sure that we are fully covered and any other kind of disputes and now we'll focus on the royalty disputes no i think it was mostly the focus of our disagreements unfortunately what disagreements did you have and again what i'd like you to do is just sort of run through them chronologically and don't repeat what you've testified to already but disputes you had with regard to royalties with neil i think that it was they were just sort of an ongoing conversation of you know quote if you're going to do this, then how would I get paid? End quote. And we were always trying to figure out how to make those payments. And again, I'd go, quote, how do you want to be paid? End quote. And then he would uh, give me those terms, you know, based on the DC information. And in some instances, we applied them. And sometimes, you know, again, uh, there was inconsistencies or disagreement that we couldn't come to. So sometimes we did it. Sometimes we didn't. And what would happen when you didn't? I'd usually get a phone call from Neil. If you didn't agree with his view, would you pay him something or would you pay him nothing? I think every every instance sort of had its own unique moment depending on where we were in the relationship at that given time. What I'd like to do is just kind of work through chronologically the disputes that arose over royalties as best you can. What was the first problem that arose? When did it occur, you say? Mr. Kahn, what was the first problem? Mr. Arnston, yes. I think you testified earlier, you thought that disputes first started coming up around 94 sometime, and I'm just trying to get a chronology of them. It may have been, and I wouldn't, in this case, I wouldn't use the word dispute. It would just be the conversation coming up about, hey, there's now a toy, and so do I get paid? Am I going to get any money from that toy, end quote. Is that the Angela toy? No, this was the medieval spawn toy. Okay, and how was that resolved? I'd ask him how he'd get paid from a derivative character with toy merchandising, and he must have given me a formula because I know some payment was made early on. Do you recall whether you paid him according to the formula he gave you or... Yes. Or on some other basis? No, I think it was on the formula he gave me. Okay, that was on the Medieval Spawn 2? Right. Okay, what was the best you recall the next dispute that arose? I wouldn't use dispute, you know, inquiry. Inquiry. That's a better word. Maybe. Maybe the Angela figure came out maybe in the next series. Okay, and how was that resolved? Pretty much the same way, you know, quote, uh, how would you get paid for a new character and what's the formula? And then I think there may have been a payment based on that conversation and those formulas. So as best you can recall, did you pay him based on the formula he gave to you or on some other basis? No, I think on the ones he gave to me. Okay, and that was for the first Angela toy? Yes. Okay. Were there more than one Angela toy? There was a 13-inch Angela figure later on, maybe a year later or something. Okay. Did you pay Neil for that on the same formula? I don't know the specifics of that, but I believe a payment was made for, for a 13-inch toy on it. And on the same formula that Neil gave to you? I don't know. So it would depend on when we paid it. So was there a cosmic Angela figure? Right. Is that what you're referring to? No. Or is that a third one? No, the 13-inch Angela. Okay. That was just sort of a bigger version of the first one. Were there other Angela toys? No, those were the only two. No Cosmic Angela? Oh, that would be a derivative of Angela, wouldn't it? Yes, and did you pay Neil anything for that? No, because... Because... I don't know if that's true. I would have to say I don't know. You don't know if you paid Neil anything for that? No. Mr. Khan. Let me at least note we produced, and Neil has it, an actual royalty sheet in 97 that shows calculations based on something 
for all of these different items. Mr. Arnston, uh-huh. Mr. Khan, and if you want to, if he doesn't remember, you can show him that. Mr. Arnston, no, oh no, I understand that. Were there any other derivative Angela toys? I don't think so. Okay, there's a red Angela or... Red Angela, there was a red Angela, right, right. <laughs> Did you pay Neil for, for that, do you know? I don't know. Okay, were there any Cogliostro toys? One. Did you pay Neil for that? I don't know. Do you recall Neil making an inquiry about that? Yes. What do you recall in that regard? Quote, how, how am I going to get paid on this? Okay, remember, we have sort of a slight variation on like where Cog stands and all of this. And so Cog might have, might have been one of those formulas that may or may not have made sense to both of us collectively. So I don't know if we paid on Cog one way or the other. So you may have asked, he may have, and asked, and you said, well, we disagree on this. And that was where it was left? Yes, I don't recall. Okay. Have we covered as best we can your conversation, your discussions about it? We are going chronologically now, right? Mr. Khan. He's referring just to this Cogliostro toy. Oh, I see. He may have brought it up uh, in subsequent conversations. Uh, Mr. Arnston. Okay. Do you have any sp specific recollection of that? No. Okay. What was... So now what we have... Have we covered the inquiries relating to toys, or are there some more? No, I think that's... I think that covers most of it. We sort of started chronologically, and then we sort of went to subject matter. Now, going back to chronologically, what other inquiries or disputes arose? Specific to what now? To, with regard to royalty payments for Neil. I think we've been talking about toys so far. So another category outside of, outside of toys. Yes. Any other disputes in any other categories? Well, inquiries. Disputes... I don't know if we are at a full-fledged dispute at this point. Inquiries. We got to dis we got to dispute eventually. Yes. I think that through the confines of licensing some of the spawn products, uh, there were trading cards or odds and ends, things that were that were not comic books that every now and then he'd ask about or he'd see or we talk about or something. And how were those resolved? I don't know. Like I said, sometimes there was payments and sometimes there weren't. Uh, so, you know, somebody uh, would have to show me paperwork and then I'll be able to tell you how they were solved. I don't know how every conversation was solved or not solved. Okay. And some were and some weren't. Okay. Did any issues occur? Inquiries with regard to royalty payments for reprints? Yes, I believe so. Okay. What do you recall in that regard? Well, again, in the conversations... Uh, are becoming a little repetitive at this point. It's just insert blank into, you know, oh, Todd, you know, how is it going to work for this product? And so insert whatever product you want, toy, comic book, trade paperback, insert whatever you want. And so how do you think it should be solved? Uh, you know, well, again, you know, most of the time we were talking about the DC contracts, quote, well, how does it work? Give me the numbers, end quote. And we were trying to work out those numbers. Uh, just again, as time went by, those numbers at times either began to move or given that they were starting to get into not sp specific conversations, but again, we were starting to get into sort of bigger generality of our not seeing eye to eye that we were starting to head towards not worrying about solving individual problems. <laughs> Let's just see if, if someday uh, we can actually solve the big enchilada as a whole. And so I don't know if those inquiries were tied to a specific need or an overall need. So at some point in time, did you sort of refocus your efforts from solving, from dealing with specific inquiries to saying, look, can we reach a global resolution of these issues so that we can stop squabbling over them? Yes, I think so. Okay. How did that come about? How did that come about? Yes. I'm getting tired of Neil phoning all the time, really. So it's like, you know, and there's only one way to keep him quiet. Just sort of come to some resolution of what it is he keeps phoning about. Okay, so how did you go about trying to accomplish that? You know, I think initially, Neil and I may have had some conversations together, given that over time, uh, that didn't really solve the dispute. Then Larry Martyr got brought into it, sort of. I think we were hoping if we put somebody between the two of us, it would be beneficial to somebody to come in there uh, looking at the boys and sort of going, there's a way we can sort of figure this out. 
So Larry became involved. Later on, even with Larry in there, he wasn't able to he wasn't able to sort of crack that nut. And so I went back to sort of kneel and I sort of going at it again, if you will, and trying to sort of come to some resolution. How did it who who got Larry involved? You or Neil? I don't know. I probably. I probably say I may have suggested it possibly yes. Okay. And what generally was the framework of the deal you were trying to work out? With Neil at the time? Yes. Oh, that actually was the question of the day. What was it we were we were actually all talking about because we couldn't seem to get a handle on it. So Larry's task was to sort of go, what is it you think the problem is here, uh, Neil? Uh, what are your concerns? What are your concerns, Todd? Uh, is there some place we could find a common ground, end quote? And then eventually sort of plow our way through it. So I think it was sort of a bigger task as to what are we even talking about here? And what were your concerns? What were my concerns? Wanting more than anything else to have spawn lock, stock, and barrel, have my baby back hole, not have a sliver of it existing someplace that I somehow can't control. All right. Any other concerns? Having, again, control over Cogliostro, who I felt was a character that I, for all intents and purposes, fed to Neil. And then Angela. I sort of understood Angela. I understood Angela. I don't think Angela, in theory, was much of a of a conflict really other than accounting but the theory I don't think was ever a problem and what was the theory I'm very curious about that <laughs> uh, that within the confines of doing work on a comic book uh, that if somebody creates a new character that is used subsequently that there's certain entitlements to accounting rights not intellectual rights but accounting rights based on the usage dependent upon what company you're working for or not working for so I tried to use some of that so I've been involved in that at DC and Marvel. Who in your view had the intellectual rights to Angela? I did. And based on what? Based on Neil saying, saying could you match my DC contract? Uh, which maybe was a bad assumption. I guess we'll find out later. I'm betting that there's no contract out there which they give the trademarks or copyrights to the individual freelancers. And given that he wanted me to match the contract, I bet you paragraph one says this is a work for hire contract. Whereupon a short recess was then had at 4.26 p.m. until 4.30 p.m. Back to Mr. Arnston. So we are talking about the process where you and Neil are trying to work out a sort of global resolution, correct? Correct. All right. And initially Larry Martyr is involved in that in trying to mediate a deal, correct? I wouldn't use initially, but he comes into the process. He comes into the process, and your primary, your first concern was getting complete control over Medieval Spawn, correct? Right. And you also wanted control over Cogliostro, correct? Right. And in your view of, if I understand correctly, you didn't view any real conceptual disagreement between you and Neil with regard to rights to Angela, is that correct? Right, generally. I mean, you have to work out the specific accounting issues. Right. The devil is in the details. Right. But in general terms, you thought that that was probably... Yes. Okay. And then it was just an issue of accounting issues. One, past payments, and two, basis for future payments, correct? Right. Any other issues? In regards to? This global resolution with Neil. I think it was inclusive. I mean, again, he wanted it to be inclusive. We both actually, I believe, wanted it to be inclusive. We didn't want to leave any piece on the table so that it would start this. So I, I believe that the conversation, those global conversations, were trying to not exclude actually anything that that when we got to that resolution, we would both be 100% satisfied with how we got there, or at least equally dissatisfied, if you will. Right. And so at least, again, initially, there were sort of the three topics where the three characters that were in Spawn 9, Medieval Spawn, Cogliostro, Angela and sort of intellectual and accounting issues relating to those characters, correct? I don't know that in, the intellectual was ever a big hot topic. It was, it was mostly accounting. It was mostly accounting issues. Well, for instance, with Medieval Spawn and Cogliostro, you wanted the intellectual issues sort of wrapped up in your favor, correct? Right. Now, uh, Mr. Khan... Counsel, just so we are clear when we read this transcript, even at trial, when you say the intellectual issues mean intellectual property issues, Mr. Arnson, yes, Mr. Kahn, 
Or are you talking about something else, Mr. Arnson? No, intellectual property issues. I used his phrase, Mr. Khan, right. Mr. Arnson, now at some point in time, a character called Miracle Man came into the mix, correct? Yes. And as best I can recall, you sort of offered up Miracle Man as something to kneel in connection with a global resolution. Is that correct? Cartoonist Kayfabe is brought to you by the comic books that Ed Piscor and I make. And March is Cartoonist Kayfabe Month at your local comic book shop, starting with Hulk Grand Design. The uh, history of the Hulk celebrating 60 years of Hulk comics distilled down into two oversized issues that will be in comic shops in March, Hulk Grand Design Monster. And in April, Hulk Grand Design Madness. Tell your local comic shop to reserve those or to pre-order those for you now. Also starting in March, Red Room, Trigger Warning. Ed Piscor's next chapter in the Red Room saga begins in March. Again, tell your local comic shop to reserve Red Room Trigger Warnings for you. Tell them which cover you want to pick up of Red Room Trigger Warnings. And that will be coming out monthly beginning in March at your local comic shop. We also have books in print that you can pick up from your local comic shop, bookstore, online, wherever you buy books. WYSIWYG, History of Computer Hacking, an absolutely stunning book designed to resemble the early Macintosh computers and uh, nominated for uh, an Eisner for the design of this book. Red Room, the Antisocial Network, collecting the first season of Red Room Comics. All four issues, plus a lot of great bonus material in the back. The History of Hip Hop told in four oversized glorious volumes and available in these deluxe box sets and the beginning of the grand design concept x-men grand design three oversized volumes telling the the history of x-men in one concise mega epic story and uh, this is actually available in both oversized books as well as a collected edition which is pretty hard and kind of rare to find but if you do come across it at your local comic shop pick that one up because I believe it's out of print. The books of mine that you can find in print are Plain Jane's, one of the first young adult graphic novels. You can see 500 pages, kind of resembles a manga about a bunch of high school students who start doing public art around their their town and get in all sorts of trouble. And Street Angel, Deadliest Girl Alive, a homeless ninja on a skateboard published by Image Comics. This is a full color book collecting eight complete stories of the deadliest girl alive. Again, these books are available wherever you buy books, your local comic shop, bookstore, online, or even a good library. And now back to our regular scheduled programming. Yes. Okay, tell me about Miracle Man and how you acquired rights to Miracle Man. There's a company called Eclipse Comics that published a lot of comic books. They must have must have had some financial difficulties because at some point they went into bankruptcy and and within the confines of it going into bankruptcy, some of the books and the properties that they had uh, in the past were part of the assets were that you would potentially be bidding on in that bankruptcy hearing or auction or uh, I don't even know what it officially was called. And within the confines of that, then in talking uh, about Terry Fitzgerald, you know, I went, quote, hey, Eclipse is up. You know, there's some cool characters in there. You know, we should sort of stick our nose in and see see what sort of comes out of it, end quote. I think they held a telephone auction. A handful of people were on it. I don't believe they ID'd anybody. And just to make sure they didn't, I think I even had Terry doing the bidding for me so they didn't think Big Daddy Warbucks is here. Uh, and so there was a sort of a quick, fairly quick auction and I ended up winning the auction and all the all the provisions that came with it through the bankruptcy trustee that was presiding over it. And what did you get in that auction? Physically, it was like some reprints of comic books or inventory of comic books. I think there was some trading cards. Uh, there may have been a little bit of film, just sort of knickknacks. I think there were just sort of clearing out Eclipse's warehouse and whatever had dust on it sort of went the whole kit and caboodle at that point. And how about other than physical things? Then the intellectual properties that went with it, the trademarks and the properties that went with the auction, that they said uh, there were trademarks and copyrights to some of the characters that went with it. Uh, So there were sort of more interesting, those were sort of more interesting to me than back issues of books that nobody cared about. And what rights did you acquire from the Eclipse bankruptcy? And I'm talking about intellectual property rights to the Miracle Man character. The 
the paperwork, I think, said trademark and copyright. And so was it a full, complete copyright or was it a joint ownership or what were you getting? I think the paperwork didn't break it down at that point. So did you know whether anyone else had trademark or copyright rights to Miracle Man? No. Okay. You just got what Eclipse had. I don't know. 95. Oh, oops. I'm sorry. Right. Okay. And when did you get those rights? I don't know. 95, 96, some, some place in the mid nineties. Did you ever do anything with them? Some of them, you know, not a, not a lot, but some of them, some of them I, I did. I think I did a comic book called Total Eclipse and put some of the characters, revamped some of the characters and put them in there, did some artwork, artwork, uh, gave some back history to it. How about the Miracle Man character? I don't think he was in that book, so... Did you do anything with regards to the Miracle Man character after you acquired the rights out of the Eclipse bankruptcy? Initially, no. Not it. Not initially, no. And what caused you to believe that Neil Gaiman might be interested in Miracle Man rights? I was aware that, again, the Miracle Man comic book that was published by Eclipse had a number of issues, and a couple of those issues were done by Neil, and so he had done some of it. I may have read some place where he may have said that the company went belly up before he was able to finish his story or something. So, you know, somewhere along the line, I had heard Neil sort of mention the character before. Okay, so what were your thoughts with regard to putting Miracle Man in the mix in your attempt to resolve your issues with Neil? Well, again, I was, I was hoping that there would be, that there may be a wild card in the deck called Miracle Man that may or may not have some value. And so if we sort of hit some snag where we couldn't resolve some of the issues that maybe uh, there is sort of a more non-traditional way to resolve it by going, let's do a, let's do a character swap or a hostage <laughs> swapping, <laughs> if you will, you know, of some of these characters. And so Miracle Man potentially became, became that. Have you finished your answer? I'm sorry. I thought it was, it became the Mr. Khan. When he stops talking, he's finished, <laughs> Mr. Arneson. So first, with regard to sort of character issues, non-percentage, non-money issues, did you, were you and Neil able to work out a general agreement with regard to the characters? No. Okay. What was your position? My, my position was that, and I think it was early on, I think it was, I'm hoping uh, close to Neil's, which was to resolve all the global matters. And so I know that as we, as we got pretty close, I think we came fairly close uh, that we sort of laid all the cards out and said, okay, here's a value here, here's a value here. You know, my intent was to get Spawn back. I want Spawn. I mean, this is, at this point, I've got a movie coming out, I've got a TV show, and somehow I don't know, I don't own this guy Lock, Stock, and Barrel. I've got to get my baby back. So I'm trying to, I'm trying to sort of go, well, okay, uh, I know you got some sort of de derivative rights to contracts. Uh, so how do I get it back? And, you know, I'm in no, I don't know whether we were going to be able to resolve it monetarily. So maybe it's like, maybe he, there's a piece of a baby out there he might like, and we could, we could come to some agreement. And I think that was overall the intent, uh, that we were hoping for is to lay all the cards out and see if there's some way to mix and match. Was Medieval Spawn in the movie? No. Was he in the TV show? In the TV? Maybe for a brief moment in one episode. Okay, so what was the sticking point that kept the deal from getting resolved? From my perspective, it was it was it was Medieval Spawn. But was Neil willing to essentially convey all rights he would have to Medieval Spawn to you as part of the deal? Yes, I think so. We had those conversations right. Okay, so what kept the deal from getting closed? Well, I'm going to tell you because now we're going to get to the heart of the matter here. All right. That that in my follow up conversation with Terry Cunningham. She told me that what Neil was dangling over me essentially. Now she didn't use those terms. Let's talk about her derivative character. Uh, that was what was dangling over my head, which was a derivative character of something that I had created that essentially using the DC contract that he kept pointing to that essentially he had never had those rights. So the thing that was the most valuable that he kept holding against me essentially from my perspective from my perspective, I'd never had. Uh, and so everything up to that point was based on trying to get it back, my baby back. And I felt, I found out that my baby, that I had my baby all along. 
And so those were the moments where if Neil was ever upset, I was equally upset. And does this, is this that phone conference with Terry Cunningham that you testified to earlier? Right. That was the only communication you had in this regard? Right. Okay. And so you had this conversation with Terry Cunningham and did that change your, what you were willing to do as part of the deal? It changed. It changed. I don't know if it overly changed the deal. I may have had some modification, but it changed my willingness that, but again, at this point, in spite of my, my better judgment, I just sort of wanted uh, this to be over as much as Neil wanted this to be over. All right. And so what kept it from being over? Because Neil, in trying to settle it, gave me some more numbers that when I had a follow-up conversation with Terry, she told me that those numbers were not correct either. So now we're in a spot where I don't know where the beginning of truth is on, is on uh, what it is, or even we are essentially almost back to square one of going, what are we talking about now? Because we can't get to, we can't seem to get a handle, or at least from my perspective, I can't get a handle on what it is we're even trying to do to resolve because, because now we're going, quote, well, who has what, end quote. Uh, so that sort of unfortunately leads us to today. What was the second conversation with Terry Cunningham? It may have been on how to spend money on people in movies or television shows or on how they divide those monies up. No, I mean, I guess you indicated there was a second conversation that really caused the deal to fall apart, correct? Uh-huh. You have to use words. Oh, yes. Okay. And it arose out of Neil giving you some numbers, correct? Right. And what numbers did he give you with regard to what? I don't recall the specific numbers. I just felt that whatever it was was inconsistent uh, with information I was getting. And what did the numbers relate to? I think it may have been, I think it may have been film Hollywood stuff, maybe. Film Hollywood stuff? Mm-hmm. Uh -huh. You have to use words. Yes. With regard to what characters? I don't recall specifically. Well, it would have been either Angela Cogliostro or Medieval Spawn. Right. One of those three. Or it might have actually been just a breakdown of that category. Film Hollywood stuff? Right. And so Neil gave you some numbers in that regard, correct? Correct. And was that in terms of royalty percentages? Yes. I think most of the numbers that the Neil and I passed back and forth to each other were representatives. And again, this was after you had this conversation with Terry Cunningham with regard to DC's treatment of derivative works, right? Right. And so if Neil provided some numbers relating to Hollywood stuff and you, and did he tell you that this was his deal with DC? Yes. I don't remember the specifics. All I remember uh, was that at the end of the conversation going, quote, another inconsistency, end quote. And I was, that was my emotional break at that point. And so Neil gave you these numbers and you decided to verify them with Terry Cunningham, correct? Right, right. So you called Terry Cunningham. Right. Okay, and tell me as best you can that conversation. I don't remember the specifics other than I, I got the same answer, which is, no, it wouldn't work that way, Todd. Okay, what did you tell her? Probably asking her generalities of whatever it was the last numbers that were put in front of me. Okay, and again, I'm just surprised because if this is what caused this whole thing to blow up. Uh, this is the proverbial straw on the camel's back. So this is why that conversation isn't as nearly important as to the ongoing burden leading up to this. So that clarifies it, hopefully. Well, it does, but again, I'm just puzzled that if this is the straw that broke the camel's back, I'm just surprised you can't remember it better. Right. Have you told me everything you can recall about this second conversation with Terry Cunningham? Right. And when was this kind of in a time sequence in relation to your first conversation with her? Shortly thereafter? Months? Yes. I don't recall. It could have been the next day. It could have been a year later. There's, there's space in between, and I don't know. I don't know the difference between the two. Okay. So you had this conversation with Terry Cunningham, and then what happened next with regard to this dispute? From, from my point of view... Uh, then everything up to this point was rescinded and null and void. I just, I'm, I'm done. I'm done. I'm done. He's got money. Uh, I've been giving him money at this point based on things that may or may not have been true. He's been feeding me potentially things that are not completely truthful. I'm heading into my movie just coming out. The TV show's on. 
I can't enjoy the moment that I should be enjoying at this moment. And he potentially has taken uh, as a swap a part of this Miracle Man. And so I get suckered. I got suckered here and I just went, no, no, it's not going to happen. So did you communicate that to Neil in any way? No. Did you tell your people to make any more payments to Neil? Right. Do you recall about when this was? It would have been probably in the fourth quarter of 97, late 97, somewhere in there. What happened next? You know, I don't think much. I may have gotten on the phone and went, you know what? Grab Miracle Man back uh, because he just he just took something that wasn't that wasn't a fair swap. And after that, probably uh, between Neil and I, dead silence. Uh, la later on, I think after he wasn't getting payments, he was going, what's happening? What's happening? Where's my payment? I think I sent him out a letter sort of stating that there was no deal. So when was the last time you talked to Neil Gaiman? I can't recall. At some point in time, you applied for a trademark for Miracle Man, right? Right. And what was your basis for believing that you were the owner of that trademark at the time of that application? From the assets that I acquired at the bankruptcy. And what about those assets caused you to believe that you had rights to the Miracle Man trademark? I believe there's a document from the court or the trustee or that said that it was included as part of that. Just so the record's clear, Alan, this is Mr. Kahn. Just so the record's clear, Alan, I think when they first applied, if you're speaking of the 1997 application, it was an intent to use, which is a form of a trademark registration application. Mr. Arnson, just, and I think what I'm just going to do is a little bit of cleanup here today, and then we'll start tomorrow morning with the documents and we'll move through that. Did you talk to anybody other than your lawyer to get ready for this dis deposition? I don't think so. Okay. Did you look at any documents to prepare for it? Outside of with my lawyer, you mean? Well, I want to know what documents you looked at, Mr. Kahn. Well, I'm trying to avoid, trying to get you an answer without invading work product privilege. And I'll go this far. I'll say that I gave Todd for him to look through a chronological sampling of communications between him and Neil and the stuff Larry attempted to mediate. Mr. Arnson, did you look through anything else other than this chronological sampling that Attorney Khan just referenced? There might have been some accounting spreadsheets. And where did you get those? Mr. Khan, it would have been from me. That part of it which was included in the stuff I mentioned earlier. Mr. Arnson, okay, does your wife have some duties with your business? Yes. What, uh, over what period of time? Off and on starting in 1992. Up through the present? Yes. And were there any periods of time that she wasn't involved in your businesses during that time period? Yeah. What periods were those? Oh, probably in 92. And we had another child in, in 94. So she probably backed off there. And then again, we had another child in 99. Uh, so sometimes uh, she was, sometimes she was 100% involved. I mean, it was sort of it would sort of fluctuate depending upon the needs of the family, I guess. And what were your wife's duties and responsibilities? They varied on a given task. You know, everything. She pr pretty much done a little bit of everything probably along the way. You know, so. For instance, was she involved at all in these communications or payments to Mr. Gaiman? I think so. I think uh, she had some involvement. Do you recall what that involvement was? Not specifically. And just some sort of background questions on the various corporate entities here. Todd McFarlane Productions, Inc. Are you the sole owner? Yes. When did you start that company? I think in 1992. Are there any other officers of the company? Uh, of that company? Yes. I don't think so. Okay. And what's the business of Todd McFarlane Productions? Doing publishing, licensing, holding the trademarks, uh, doing freelance artwork. I mean, the whole sort of gamut of creating ideas and stuff. TMP International, Inc. Are you the sole owner of that? Yes. When did you start that? Maybe the beginning of 94, maybe. And what's its business? Most of it is the manufacturing and selling of action figures. You said most of it. What's the rest of it? I think some we do. I think we have done like an odd vehicle or, you know, a box or something that's a little off center. But, you know, still plastic goods, if you will. Plastic toys. McFarlane Worldwide. I don't know. Are you the sole owner? Yes, probably. What does it do? You know what? I don't know. I've got a lot of accountants and a lot of lawyers and a lot of tax reasons for doing stuff. Okay. So I don't know that. Todd McFarlane Entertainment, Inc. That is a company that takes ideas into Hollywood and sees if anybody will bite on any of those. Has Todd McFarlane Entertainment, Inc. ever involved anything with the Angela, Cogliostro, or Medieval Spawn characters? No. 
McFarland Toys Canada Inc. What's that? That essentially does the same business as McFarland Toys. It's just that, again, there are different rules and regulations uh, when you are distributing products up in Canada. So you need another company to sort of abide by certain tax laws and rules. Did that company produce any toys showing the Angela, Cogliostro, or Medieval Spawn characters? No. McFarland Toys, Inc., what's that? I think that... I think that's probably the DBA or something. Oh, okay. Do you know what that is, DBA? No. Okay, favors, put something in the comments. We don't know that kind of shit. Um, uh, it's what we use. Uh, it's the name... It's the name on all the toys. McFarland Toys, not TMP International. So it's the DBA with TMP International? I believe so. Mr. Kahn, it may have once been in the McFarland Toys, Inc. I don't know. Mr. Arnson, TMP Asia Limited. That helps us have an office in Hong Kong. It helps us with our international sales to our various distributors internationally outside of North America. With toys or publications? With toys. Did it produce anything with Angela Cogliostro or Medieval Spawn? No. McFarlane Europe DB, what's that? Another channel of being able to distribute toys into Europe and so. Does that include any Angela Cogliostro or Medieval Spawn characters? In terms of what? Is McFarlane Europe DB involved in distribution? Probably over. Uh, if they were, if the company was alive uh, when those toys were produced, they probably would have had some involvement. And when was that? When were Medieval Spawn toys produced? Medieval Spawn was, you can't lock me on this, uh, it might have been 94 and Angela was 95. And was there ever a Cogliostro toy? Yes, but that was, I believe that was done through our collector's club. So that was, that was never done as a wide distribution product. Okay, so were any of these companies we've talked about involved in that toy? Well, I don't know how collector's club falls under all the umbrellas, but the collector's club sells specialty toys, uh, if you will, or limited runs of toys that we don't sell nationally. So I don't know if that's, if that's collector's club. I think this is actually an official company, you know, so, but... Mr. Khan, but the toys are made by TMP International, right? Right, right. Mr. Khan, just to give Alan that, all roads with toys lead back to TMP International, right? Right. TMP International is the toy manufacturer. Mr. Arnston, all right. TMP International manufactures all of these toys that some of these various corporations may be involved in the distribution of, correct? Correct. What's McFarland Global DB? Don't know. Okay. What about TMP Equities Inc.? Don't know. Okay. Quick answer to that. You've testified as to a couple conversations with Terry Cunningham. Is she someone whom you spoke with on a regular basis? No. So, I mean, how many phone conversations can you recall that you've had with her? You talked about two, but I mean, I'm just trying to get a sense. In my life, you mean? Yes. Well, I don't know. Terry Cunningham was sort of the first person I ever knew at DC Comic Books because I testified earlier. I believe that I had a contract with DC Comic Books early in my career. All those negotiations, all subsequent conversations, all follow-up, always ran through Terry. So my point person at DC Comic Books on any contractual conversations or even looking for answers all went through Terry. Okay. How about since you started with Image? Since 1992, how often have you talked with her? Not much. You know, again, I run into her uh, the odd time at a convention, maybe. Maybe the odd time I've been in New York, swung by the office and said hi, but... Have you called her on any occasions other than the two you've testified to? Since then, you mean? Yes. I don't think so. Okay, and just if I understand correctly from your testimony with regard to Neil's DC contract issues, you first had a phone call with her in which you talked about derivative characters, correct? Right, right. sorry. And then you testified to that, and I believe it was your testimony that even following that conversation, you were still willing to go forward with your deal with Neil, correct? We were still, I was still willing to try and find a resolution. Then the second conversation that you testified to was what made you stop trying, is that correct? Yes, yes. Unfortunately, yes. Mr. Arnson, okay. Why don't we take a break for the evening? Mr. Kahn, okay. Whereupon the deposition was then concluded at 10, at 5, 10 p.m. There it is, man. Day one of uh, McFarland's deposition. Man, I hope I'm never in a deposition. Oh, I know. Like... <laughs> Like uh, even it's if so painful to, to 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 imagine this. Yeah, yeah. Like uh, like uh, I'll focus on you. Room full of people, uh, bound by 
you know, perjury laws or something, man. So you don't want to ever accidentally miss misspeak. A lot of pressure. Yeah. Um, trying to trying to find consensus agreement. On, I mean, you're there because you can't find consensus agreement. So now we have to find out what the exact argument is. And I don't know about you, Jimmy, but I've certainly been in situations where I got mad at somebody and like forgot why or so like I just don't know the exact answer. And he has to and you have to say that in front of people <laughs> and you sound real dumb when you articulate it, like when it's private and just inside yourself. And you're like, you know what? I don't remember why I would dislike that person or something. But now you got to put it out there. Yeah. And there's this straw that broke the camel's back or however he put it. But he can't remember the the body of that discussion exactly. I mean, you get inferences that he's been getting numbers from Neil and the numbers that he's getting from him ha- are divorced from the numbers he's getting from the DC lady. I could see how, how that can make you fucking nuts, man. You yeah, know? absolutely. Like, like, he has to have other people participate in auctions for him because you get, you get gangstered, man. Uh, you always hear... Like if you're a Howard Stern listener or something, the efforts he has to go through to just have a sink repaired in his house because they find out that it's Howard Stern who who needs that work. You're getting you're charging you three x at the at the very least, and and you know like he's in a Stern is was getting like work done on his apartment. That work was being done on his apartment through the tenure of my listening. I haven't listened in a long time, but they were taking their good old time. And something tell me tells me that uh, the work uh, for the final product exceeded the estimates that were given <laughs> initially. And I think that that is just built into like celebrity lifestyle, successful personal lifestyle. And it's a fucking headache. And you have people coming at you from a million different angles. So you have to be defensive if you want to sort of keep your wealth. But this is two wealthy dudes who are advocating for themselves. Neil Gaiman seeing these fig- these figures in, in toy stores. He's seeing Angela show up in at least a cameo appearance or something on the movie and the cartoon. Cogliosho plays a big part. He had a hand in that. Pay me something. Yeah, it's easy to understand. I, I actually think after reading this, it's easy to understand both of these points of view. Totally. Like I can see, obviously, Neil Gaiman's point of view... I wrote this character and now I'm seeing toys. I should get some of that. Totally makes sense. The, the, the amount of the sum, I guess, is where this dispute really, what it boils down to. And you can kind of understand this. McFarlane's doing his due diligence according to his testimony, you know, looking up what a DC contract actually pays for these things and finding information that's different than what he claims Neil is telling him. Got to go to court. I guess so. Got to put it all the cards out on the table and have a jury of the peers or however that works. It's wild to think, you know, like what we read today at one point, they're almost there. Yeah. And it's it's to think of like where it's going to go after being so close, according to McFarlane. Just horrible. Like nobody wants to spend their time this way. No, no. And, and, and the, the truth is you don't like these guys do their depositions and now lawyers are working together for years. And I wonder how that works, man, because in the, in the work that I've done with, with lawyers, it's like, it's uh, all for good stuff, just contract things and things. But there's all this lag time. Yes. And it's like, what the, f- like, I could have this conversation in 10 minutes. Like, why, why does it have to happen two Thursdays from now or something? Like, just get it done. Right. Get it done. And it's, uh, it's very true. I have a contract I'm waiting on. It's been going on for three months or, or more at this point. And it does feel like it's, I can tell you, it's not a very big, <laughs> nothing special going on. But it's just, they need a piece of information and then weeks go by. Yeah, yeah. They just, you just get this stuff done. So these guys are going back living their lives. That part with, um, you know, McFarland has all this good stuff coming out and he's got this this nag in the back of his head. Like, I feel for that, man. Because it's like, you got something cool going on. It should be your proudest, the proudest time of your life. Like, there should be spawn emblem cakes that are made and, and parties to be had. But now you got this, like, legal thing in the back of your mind. It's hurting your stomach uh, at least a little bit. You know, keeping you up at night at least a little bit. Yeah, it's a distraction. And, you know... Just paying taxes as a regular citizen can keep a person up at night a little bit. Man. I got a lot of 1099 forms <laughs> this past very, year. That is very, very true. Yeah, freelancing life. Uh, there's a lot of extra 
You know, the, the, the administrative stuff of just if everything's going smooth, it still takes up a bunch of time that's rarely factored into anybody's schedule. Yeah. Um, yeah, I, I, like I said, I, I think it's easy to see both sides of what has been presented up to this point. Yes, man. Listen, this is not the list. The end of the Todd McFarlane deposition in the case with Neil Gaiman. The end result is, I think, three separate court cases all in favor of Neil Gaiman. So sev- some of those were were ap- ap- appellate court decision uh, court cases. Mm-hmm. Everything goes back uh, in, in Neil Gaiman's favor. He gets Angela. Angela becomes like the sister of Thor or something in Marvel Comics. Uh, there's a, a Miracle Man comic that Joe Quesada told us didn't tell us that he's drawing, but I think he showed some pages or whatever. And it's you see Miracle Man like opening up like Mar- Marvel Comics number one with like Marvel characters and stuff. Like it, these characters are used and abused, man, and going through all these different publishers and stuff. Ultimately, it all it all goes back to 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 Neil, and then Neil like I think just being cheeky, being an asshole. Sells it off to, to Marvel or whatever, the the uh, the nemesis of Todd McFarlane. However, that plays out. Um, big headache, but not the last courtroom dramas we have to unpack. Sadly, <laughs> sadly, not the last courtroom dramas uh, that comics are littered with. Yes, yes. Somebody sent us a comics journal with Marv Wolfman stuff in regards to either Blade or Nova or something. Uh, we have to take a good look at that and see if that's a deposition or an interview because like people people are they're confusing what this mm-hmm. is a little bit. People are like, yo, you should read the Gary Groth yeah. Todd McFarlane uh, interview. It's not what this is. I want stuff under oath. Yes. I want these guys presumably telling their version of the truth. Yeah, plus that's public domain yeah. materials and we have some of that. We we still have Michael Fleischer work uh, to 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 uh, get into Harlan Ellison testimony in a court of law, Gary Groth testimony in a court of law, Dean Mullaney as a character witness against Comics Journal and Gary Groth in a court of law in front of a jury of the peers. That's different than what we're doing Mm -hmm. here. This is a bunch of lawyers sitting around a table, video camera on, you get your drinks, you get to be laissez-faire a little bit, or blase-faire, as uh, Todd McFarlane says. But you still got to use your words. Uh-huh. Uh-huh. <laughs> uh, but that stuff is, you know, straight courtroom dramas. Uh, it allows for cross-examination, as we've seen in the Jim Shooter testimony. Uh, then we have, uh, thanks to Mike Catron from uh, Fantagraphics, sent us some great old uh, transcriptions from court cases, actual court cases, in the Victor Fox Wonder Man versus Superman uh, court case. I'm eager to get into those. We get like I think it's like Max Gaines territory, Siegel Schuster, Golden Age, Golden Age, Go- Golden court, Age cases. court cases. <laughs> it happens when it's big business, you know. And the right. Golden Age is called Golden Age for a specific reason, man. There was there was gold in them hills. I I, uh, I have been on a Golden Age kick, so uh, that's definitely a topic that I'm interested to look at um, more closely. Yeah. And it's cool that those artifacts remain because one of my big sad parts of golden age is so much of comics history is lost and obscured uh but if you have a court record that's one way to preserve some of that history so yeah i'm eager to eager to take a look at that one yes 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 uh so k favors let let us know uh which ones uh you want us to cover sooner than later we'll make our decisions uh based according to that and if you have uh any sort of scoop on where we find more of this kind of testimony or if you went to LexisNexis or whatever those websites are, put down a couple of dollars to, to, to see what was in, uh, you know, some sort of Kirkman Moore depositions or something, you could send that our way. <laughs> we'll go through that stuff a little bit. Why the heck not? Very instructive. I'm good to go if you are, Jimmy. I am too. That, that about wraps this part up. Okay, favorites, like, follow, subscribe to the YouTube channel. Hit the bell. We'll notify you when new vids are available. Jimmy Wood is out there. Hulk Grand Design. It is out there in March in your local comic book shops and in April in your local comic book shops, but now is the time to tell those local comic shop owners to order a copy for you, to pre-order the one you want, several different covers to choose from, and uh, let them know that you want that in your pull box. And uh, you can join me on patreon.com slash jimrug where you can see some of my original art, see the processes, uh, how I make the comics that I make. Red Room uh, Trigger Warnings, issue one is going to be coming out March 9th. It's going to be coming out on a monthly basis for four months. Murder on the Dark Web for Fun and Profit is the name of the game in Red Room. 
every issue completely self-contained and you can uh, read those comics today on my Patreon, patreon.com slash edpiscor. Three bucks for the archive there. I have more than 200 pages worth of material on Patreon as we speak. Put up new strips every Tuesday. You could get there to these pre-order links and my Patreon at my link tree in the description below this video. What else do we have out there, Jim? Subscribe to the Cartoonist Kayfabe e-newsletter at the links below this video. You can also find Cartoonist Kayfabe t-shirts and merchandise at the links below this video. Give them those marching orders. We're going to be on our way. Read more comics.